being slightly all over the place, but it's great to be here, great to be back. Um, Let's pray. Father, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for our church, our church community, for the relationships here, and for what you're doing with us. Thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us more about following you and about uh, discipleship, and about making disciples. And we pray today that, Lord, you'd help us to grasp more of what you have for us. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the last in this series on making disciple makers. And for those who haven't been here, we are, um, this uh, stage set is not um, uh, because we're doing building work in the church physically. Um, We do that from time to time, but we're not doing that at the moment. This represents um, what we're thinking about in terms of making disciple makers. And it really comes, the idea comes from Stanley Hauwas, who is a, a theologian. And he um, wrote about disciple-making in these terms. He said, it's not enough to know how to hold a trowel, to, to how to spread mortar, or how to frog the mortar, just to know about those things. But in order to lay bricks, you must hour after hour, day after day, lay bricks. And that's what Paul is really saying here. It's only when you take up a trowel and you get the cement and you actually put, put the, uh, the stuff on the brick and you start making the wall. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Anyway, you actually start doing that, you learn how to make a, a wall. You learn how to build a house. So Paul, when he says here, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The life of of discipleship and disciple making involves starting that life, starting to follow Jesus and starting to make disciples. That's what we're going to be looking at today. It starts by starting, hence the title of this talk, Just Do It. So we've been talking about disciple making, we just need to do it now. And um, so I'm going to... um, uh, I've started, I did this a couple of weeks ago and I enjoyed it so much. I'm going to draw my talk for you just so you can remember it. Um, so the first thing uh, this, um, this teaches us really is that discipleship is a two-way process. So this is my self-portrait. Here we go, it's a little bit of hair, not much. Okay, so this is me. And um, discipleship is a two-way process. We've received, but we also need to pass it on. We've received, but we also need to pass it on. Do you remember we looked at 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 a few weeks ago? We'd like to turn to that. It's, it's um, on a few, chapter, a few books in, in the Bible. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. It's on page 1130. 1130. Paul writing to Timothy says this, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So do you remember we looked at how Paul spent his life with, he, he spent time, he taught, he, he um, invested in this um, younger man, Timothy. And he says to Timothy, now pass this on to reliable people who are qualified to teach. And we remember we thought about actually that's people who are skilled in learning how to pass these things on, but also in their character, they're reliable people. Pass it on to them who will then entrust it, pass it on to others. Paul to Timothy, to these reliable people, to others. And so this process of discipleship involves receiving something and passing it on. Often in the church, we receive things And it becomes like a stagnant lake. Nothing gets moved on. The life of discipleship is about passing stuff on. We receive and we give it away. And so, um, you know, following Jesus is an active adventure. It's not a passive pastime. You know, we are to adopt this posture of not just being learners, but being teachers as well. 
There's something I think we naturally shy away from. It involves risk. But all of us are to have those two hats, a learner and a teacher. What we learn, we pass on. What we receive, we give. And um, it's time. Do you remember Andrew talking last week about taking responsibility? He, says, he said, no longer should we be babysitters. We need to become more like parents. Babysitters don't have any responsibility for those they're looking after, uh, other than just in and out. It's just there for a couple of hours and they go on. But Andrew's encouraging us to think about, actually, as parents, we take responsibility for people's lives. As a child, you know, you're there when, when the child is screaming at night. You're looking after uh, that child when it's sick and when it's... Uh, but there are a lot of other times when it's healthy. <laughs> but all the time, you're helping that child to be nurtured and to grow. Mike Breen um, said this. He's a, 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 a teacher in these things as well. And he just said, we need to dare to say, do as I do. It's a risk to say to other people, watch me, copy me, do what I'm doing. We often say, don't we, do as I say. <laughs> but actually, there's something more about doing as I do. Inviting people to, as we give away, pointing towards ourselves. So how is that happening here? Well, I just sent an email out at the beginning of the week to a few of the staff team here and a few others and just said, what, um, what, do, you, what, is, what do you see in the life of the church? And um, Lars, who, um, if you haven't met Lars, is uh, an intern here for four months. I, I always think um, for people who are here for a short amount of time, they notice things. And so I've really valued Lars's um, insights into um, both the, the life of the church here, but I, I take him along to the church planting work that I do as well. He's been fantastically observant, sometimes um, seeing things I don't really want him to see. And, um, uh, but actually, it's very helpful for learning and, and um, developing uh, what we're doing in terms of our training for church planters. And here's just a few of the things that Lars and Stuart and Jackie and others um, uh, said they've noticed. So Lars has said, actually, there's a, um, he's noticed the welcome. It's a, a value that's modeled here and that it runs right the way through the church, both on Sundays, in connect groups, and small groups. He has personally experienced the welcome. It's received and then it's passed on by others. He talks about the love of the Bible that's evident when we preach here on Sundays, but he's seen it then um, pushed on through the connect groups and the small groups. He's seen an explicit hunger of God amongst people that's just caught by others and passed on. Um, people using language of, of hungering after God. And, and just he's heard it everywhere. People receiving it and passing it on. He spoke to Melanie Morrill, who um, you'll know, she has started to um, disciple people around. And she's been doing that for a while. But she started asking this question, who are you discipling? Something we talked about a few weeks ago, what she received, she has passed on. Um, uh, Lars has noticed it when, uh, in our church planting work, that the churches that we've planted, we've just um, prayed for uh, Adam and Heather and Chris and Becky and um, for Ed and Fuzz. They've planted churches from here, but all of them, he's heard them saying, we're going to plant. What they've received, they're going to give. What they've done, they're going to do to others. Um, connect group leaders, he's, noticed, he's been um, on some of the rounds of connect group leaders, talking about raising up leaders. We've been talking about that here, and actually that's what him, he's actually seen. And connect groups wanting to plant connect groups themselves. What they've received, they've been planted, they want to plant on. Can you see how it's working? So um, he's noticed it in all kinds of examples of people here, people praying, people um, responding to talks, people um, praying for each other. People not just sitting back, but actually actively getting involved. This is you guys, he's um, observed. He's noticed it in the way that encouragement is given. When someone encourages something to do something, he notices then that other people start doing it. What you receive, you give. Um, Stuart's noticed in Stuart, our, our verger. As just, you know, I just said, well, what have you noticed? He said, you know, mums and tums, um, the ministry here, seeing Louis and Jess and others who are um, just pouring them, themselves into these mums and just seeing them begin to actually impact others. Um, the children's work, actually all the helpers, um, just right now, downstairs and across the way, you see these helpers, and a lot of you are helpers in that, pouring their lives into the children. 
There are connections with older people in the community through um, uh, coffee and cake. Um, Andrew um, has been going with Lars to News International just down the road. And actually saying, uh, helping them to, uh, using the God at Work material as a course, actually helping them to be able to disciple those around them. So, so many different ways, so many different things. Um, Jackie just told me about someone who um, she's uh, beginning to um, meet with, to encourage a mentor who's um, in the banking sector that um, she's been working in as well. People who are beginning to start saying, actually, it's not enough for me just to receive and receive and receive, but actually I need to pass on. Now, you're doing that, and you're doing it more and more intentionally, and that's what um, Paul is saying here. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, Paul says to the Philippians, put it into practice. Start giving that away to others. So in this first thing, it's a two-way process. I'll just write that underneath. It's two-way. It's in and it's out. Oh, an extra receiver. So that's the first thing we see in this. Second thing we see about making disciples um, from this verse is that it involves the whole of our lives. So here we have a diary. It's not just Sundays. It's all of the time. They're all your events that you're doing through the week. The diary, it's all the time. It's the whole of your life that is involved. How do we see that? Paul says, whatever you have learned or received or seen or heard, whatever. You could equally just say, whenever. You could say, wherever. It's the same thing. Whatever you've heard from me, put it into practice. So when we're starting to make disciples of others, we're saying, whatever you see in me, put it into practice. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? You think, okay, that's the ups and the downs. But do you know something? Whenever we've had people who have lived with us and um, made observations about our lives, they've actually said it's even in the way things that, you know, in the things which are challenging and difficult, for example, when we get annoyed with the children, they see the way that we do that and they've learned over a period of time, they say, actually, we have noticed that and we want to, um, you know, we, 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 we love seeing that, the whole of your life, because it encourages us and helps us. And so there's nothing like actually having someone observing the way you're annoyed with someone or the way you argue, or because um, actually we begin to start actually noticing that we might need to do it in a way that's um, helpful and honouring of others. But actually, nevertheless, there's something about inviting people into the whole of your life. So let's look at each of these words. He says, whatever you've learned, what is that posture? Do you remember, it's about receiving and giving. So um, I think with this, we need to cultivate both study, what we receive, but also teaching. So just over the last five years, at a personal level, I have um, put myself into a position of intensive study um, related to church planting and leadership development. That's sometimes, you know, four... Uh, uh, there are four or five trips I made to Europe to be part of what's called a learning community to learn about church planting. And I've just done my fourth trip to Dallas where I've been learning with other churches. I'm part of the HTB team learning about leadership development and how to encourage churches and networks of churches to grow in their raising up of leaders and developing of leaders. Because in that particular instance, um, growth happens when you've got good leaders around who can actually help nurture that growth. So the leaders, your leaders here, not just church leaders, but actually the leaders of connect groups and other ministries, nurture them, encourage them, bless them, because actually they are valuable. If they go down, actually the group falls apart. So keep praying for the leaders um, around. And if you are feeling God's calling you, stirring you into leadership, it's a fantastic thing to do because it enables the church to grow and deepen in its life. So cultivate um, study, it just makes a difference. Learn about leadership. Learn about um, more about the scriptures. Learn about how to um, be great parents or about marriage or about relationships. 
But don't just learn it. What you receive, pass on. Teach it. Tell others what you're learning. So one of the things that I'm involved with, which I want to tell you about this stuff because it involves a lot of my time and what the church has set me apart to do, which is um, we prayed about the network of churches that um, Louis and I are kind of um, overseeing. And um, uh, they're churches that have been planted from HTB. And what we've, um, we've been equipping and training them in more church planting work and more leadership development work. You see, what I've received, I'm passing on. And so I want to actively find ways now where I can help those churches to grow together and um, can multiply in what they're doing. That's part of the work that you are enabling me personally to do. Cultivate. What is it for you? Cultivate that study and learning. Um, Louis and I, this month, this summer, are going to be doing a study leave. So that means you won't see us for three months, um, June, July, and August, because we are taking time out um, of ministry just to focus our attention on a number of different things, including church planting. But um, the church is setting us apart to study so that we can then have, hopefully, 10, 20 years of passing on what we've learned in that time. So what about you? What's are you going to invest? What are you going to learn? What are you going to um, throw yourself into that you can then pass on? He talks about what you've received. So I think this is about cultivating absorption and radiation. If you're a scientist, you know about absorption and radiation. They're probably slightly different different materials going on. Anyway, um, you can absorb light and then you can radiate light. You can absorb heat and you can radiate heat. So absorption, whatever you've received, this is not just something in the mind, it's something in the heart, it's something about the whole of your life. So, um, uh, you know, who has invested in you? Who's helped you to be a disciple? The way that, um, you know, that their generosity towards you, their wisdom that you've received, perhaps the meals that um, you've, um, you, you've received from them, the encouragement that you've received. You've, you've received lot, a lot of things from many people. And now radiate that out to others. Whatever you've received from me, put it into practice. I think we almost need to have, you know those radiation things that you wear if you're a scientist going into labs and stuff? It's almost like we need those badges on us, isn't it? So, you know, be, you know, danger, I'm radiating the kingdom of God, something like that. You know, but that's what we want, isn't it? We want those danger signals all over the place because we're giving it away. Whatever Paul says, whatever you've heard from me. So we need to cultivate an attentiveness to hear the word of God when it's spoken, to hear wisdom from others, but then not just cultivating attentiveness. I think, I think the way we push this out is to, um, to cultivate clarity so that when we pass it on to others, we're clear about what we're passing on. There's a process in between that attentiveness and clarity, which is um, something verbal processes like me find slightly challenging, which is rather than getting the clarity out as you're speaking, just putting that time in to say, actually, what does this mean? What does this mean that I'm hearing? Okay, this is how I'm going to communicate that to others in a clear and simple way. I think that's the case when we're sharing our faith, isn't it? So often we can say things and, just, and we come away from um, encounters where we've talked about our faith and we just think, oh, I wish I'd been a bit clearer about what I'd said. I wish I'd just not given as much, you know, just you know, less, but just in a clearer way. That requires just really thinking and processing these things. So I, I don't know. I want to encourage you to things like to take notes um, when you hear talks. I want to encourage you to um, journal or to write stuff each day or, or, or when you um, read scriptures perhaps daily. Just... You know, what are you learning? What, is, what are you being attentive to? I think that's where connect groups and small groups are so helpful because um, on Sunday it's slightly more difficult to be interactive. But in our connect groups, we can, we can start speaking what we're hearing, debating and, and wrestling with some of these things. Whatever you've heard and whatever you've seen, cultivate observation. And cultivate being an example. 
what we observe. Just watch out for the way people are living around you. Look at um, what's going on. So, you know, often I think we need to look behind what we see just in, in practice. So I saw, um, you know, a, the, a, a child um, uh, recently just making a lot of noise in, in a parent's arms, and I thought, oh, they're making a lot of noise. And then, <laughs> then I saw beyond what I saw, and I just thought, actually, the way that parent is actually helping that child is not in a destructive way, but in a nurturing way, as they just allowed them to make that noise, but then they, they took them in a, uh, to just a side and just um, gave them the attention that the child was actually craving. Cultivate observation, what you see beyond what you see. But then, cultivate within that, being an example, actually, what you see, why don't you let others see into you? Sometimes we need to actually invite people into our lives. Sometimes we need to invite people um, by, to, to watch us by actually doing something overt rather than covering it up. Jesus said, don't cover your light under a bushel. Let everyone see the light that you have. Let it shine out. And I think that can be scary sometimes in terms of um, the way we live our lives. We choose to do things more overtly. So... Um, uh, you might have heard Nikki Gumbel uh, talking about um, Gibbo, who uh, was someone who used to work for um, Gordon Sa uh, Selfridge. And he worked in the same office as um, uh, Gordon Selfridge, as in Selfridges. And um, Gibbo was his, his clerk, basically, did lots of note taking and that kind of thing. And um, there was one time where the phone went, and he picked up the phone, and the person on the phone said, Can I speak to. Um, uh, Mr. Selfridge, please. And um, he saw Mr. Selfridge just opposite him going, tell him I'm not there. I'm, I'm not here. And he said, um, could you hold on a moment? I'll just pass him over to you. And he said, you tell him. <laughs> and Mr. Selfridge, after the phone call, was absolutely furious with Gibbo. And um, he said, why did you do that? I told you to say, I'm not here. And he said to him, if I can lie about you, I can lie to you. And from that moment on, Gibbo became his most trusted employee. We need to put it into practice, be an example that others can see. It's the whole of our lives. Third thing about making disciples, uh, making disciple makers here, is that it starts by starting. So we're not supposed to be um, just sitting down like this and just being observant. Actually, we need to start. Yeah? Start. And um, I think uh, it's just too easy to just come to church and go to connect group and then don't do anything else. And um, actually, it's easy to just sit and receive. And I did that for many years. And we need to, Paul is saying, we need to put it into practice. We need to actually start. We need to move from a pew sitter to a mover, a mover and a shaker. And I think um, it's very easy just to wait and just think, I'm just going to sit out and wait for heaven. I know I'm okay, um, but you know that's just the way I'm going to do because it's just the easiest thing to do. One of the stories I heard last week was about um, uh, the book Jules Verne's um, The Mysterious Island. Has anyone read that book, Mysterious Island? I really want to read it, having heard this summary. Basically, the, um, the story is of um, five unionists who are in prison in Richmond, Virginia, and um, they escape by getting into a balloon, classic Jules Verne, um, and um, flying away, and uh, they end up on this um, island in the, in the South Pacific, seven, 8,000 miles away. And they, are, um, they, they then arrive at, um, you know, as they kind of pull themselves together, having crash landed with this balloon, they then decide, they say, we are not, we do not consider ourselves castaways but colonists. We do not consider ourselves castaways, but
but colonists. And this book then um, really revolves around that statement. The fact that they didn't um, you know, just put in the sand this big um, help sign with seaweed and gouging it out. They said, no, we're going to invest ourselves. We're going to build something here. And in their ingenuity, they start building, you know, a brick kiln to make bread. They, um, they uh, make a camera, apparently. They make iron tools. They make a windmill, a ter- telegraph line, electric batteries, um, nitroglycerin roads, dams, multi-roomed granite cliff houses. And from a single grain of corn, they, um, uh, they stock storehouses with bushels of grain. They were colonists, not castaways. As disciples of Jesus, do you consider yourself a castaway who's just waiting to be rescued when you get to heaven? Or are you a colonist who is helping to build the kingdom of God? to start. Paul says, put it into practice. So how do we actually do that? Well, don't wait until you feel equipped and able to do make disciple making. Let me just show you something in terms of a, uh, a little graph. So if you imagine here, this is how good you are at something, competence, and this is courage. We start here, when we're completely unable to do what, you know, make disciples, and we're completely fearful about making disciples. And the, our tendency is we want to come up into this place. We want to get skilled, become competent, um, uh, without needing to exercise courage, and then we'll get to that place where we actually start doing something, start making disciples. The problem is that um, if we get here, we can stay in this place. We can get more and more equipped, more and more knowledgeable, more and more skilled. But actually, if it, 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 you actually require courage to get into this place. Do you understand that? Can you see that? So there's an intriguing verse in um, the Psalms. I just um, found it um, just before, so I'm just going to refer to it now, um, which talks about the Ephraimites. And the Ephraimites um, were described in um, Psalm 78, verse 9. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turns back on the day of battle. So they were equipped and skilled, but they turned back on the day of battle. They didn't exercise courage, and they were noted for that. And what the encouragement is, is actually I think you've just got to start. You've got to go to this place of needing to exercise courage, no matter where you are, and then you will get skilled as you do it. We've got to start, and then we'll grow in, in, in skill as we, as we start. This is the preferred route, I think, that we are called to go on. And um, in terms of making disciples, um, there is something about actually passing stuff on. So, for example, for, for me, um, I uh, disciple the staff team, and I encourage the, disciple, uh, the staff team to disciple others. So you'll have um, Rod discipling the Connect Group leaders, and the Connect Group leaders um, disciple the um, small group leaders, and the small group leaders disciple the people in their small groups. Do you see how that works? Um, you've got me discipling um, Jessica, who is um, the children's worker uh, on staff. Jessica disciples the, um, the helpers of the children's church, um, and who in turn disciple the children. She's just started. We've all just started. We need to keep going. It doesn't matter if we don't feel equipped. We get equipped, and we get more and more equipped as we go along. What you pass out, you suddenly realize, oh, well, there's um, more stuff I need to receive in order to pass it on. So I'm going to um, uh, learn more and so that I can pass it on. You see, remember that first picture? We receive to give. If you give, then there's, you, you, you see a need to receive more. So you go and receive more so that you can give. And you get into that two-way process. Um, outside the church... 
you know, it's the same thing. Actually, we, um, who are you working with? Who are you near? Um, who do you live nearby? Actually, we need to work out, okay, how can I begin to disciple those people around me, people who are far from God? I need to encourage them. I need to um, be a blessing to them. Sometimes when the opportunity and time is right, I can say the word in season that's going to make a big difference for them. I can actively help them. They can see my love as, as, um, they, as I spend time and invest my time in life with those people. What is it going to be? Share your life. Do you remember one of these talks? I can't, was it um, Rod or someone was saying about imitate me, that scripture, passing it on. It's Darren. Pass it on. What you've received, pass it on. So we've just got to start. And the fourth thing we see here is... that this is a spirit-empowered activity. We need to receive from God. What does Paul say? And the God of peace will be with you. You know, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to grow as disciples and as disciple makers. We need God to empower us so that we can give what we've received. We need God to equip us so that we can um, use the gifts that God has given us to be a blessing to other people. We need to, to uh, get into that posture where we say, God, I need your help. And so that what we receive from him, we're able to pass on. That's not just in terms of skills and knowledge and, and stuff. It's also character. You know, our lives are like a, an iceberg. Lots of people don't see what's underneath the surface. They see what we project. Character is really what's underneath the surface. It's like an iceberg. Bad character sinks ships. Godly character will empower and touch the lives of those around you. Why don't we stand and let's pray for God to empower us as disciple makers, as people who God is calling us to put into practice what we've um, learned and received and heard and seen. So we put it into practice and give these things away. I've drawn open hands, and that's a posture. It's a physical posture, like the iceberg of something actually which is saying something deeper inside us. And I want to encourage us to take that posture now and say, Lord, I want want to be empowered by you. I want the God of peace to be with me. So let's pray. God of peace, come and fill us. Holy Spirit, you're here. We pray you would impact and fuel and fill our lives. In Jesus' name. And let's wait on him. Just give him space. Spirit of God. Father, we pray particularly for courage, both inside and outside the church, but courage to start. Courage to grow. Father, 
may we not be like those Ephraimites. Though they had bows, they did not go into battle. Lord, we pray for more of you, more of you in our lives, more of you just in these particular things that we've been thinking about today. It's more, Lord, more of your empowering presence. We're going to worship a great way to not just to receive, but actually to put into practice that um, attitude of, uh, of recognizing our part. God has called us to be co-workers with him, that our, our part is junior partners as we worship the senior partner, we worship God. And I think there are um, some people who um, would love to uh, have someone lay hands on you to receive that empowering in particular. And that's um, something where um, it's more than an affirmation. It's an acknowledgement from you to say, Lord, I, I want more. And I want more of you. And I want to be equipped for more of this. And um, it might be you feel weak and afraid um, or you have started and you want to grow. And whatever it is, that there might be particular people who say, yes, I want more, more of this. And um, if that's you, I'd love as we worship just to come forwards and love to pray for you. Um, I think as well, there are others who, um, uh, there's just something that is, is like, uh, it's like an obstacle. It's not a bad thing. It's just an obstacle that's drawing your attention at this particular moment. Um, so it's other stuff. It might be there's some, I think, there's people here who'd love to be prayed for for healing. It's not that that's stopping your discipleship, but it's like that's the obstacle that is drawing your attention at the moment. And um, we'd love to pray for you to be healed. Um, it might happen today. It might happen another day. But actually, that to put yourself in that place where you say, I want to receive from you, Lord. I want to... Um, allow others to uh, join in with this discipleship process. That's what prayer is, actually. You put yourself as the receiver of prayer um, from someone else so that they can minister. And that gives them an opportunity to exercise discipleship as they pray for you. So this is something which is about church. That's what we do. And there might be other things that are just blocking your path at the moment. You're saying, I'd love someone to pray for me about that and to see that obstacle removed in, in some way. So if that's you, please come forward as we sing. Um, if there are other uh, people who can pray, please come forward. That would be fantastic as well. And let's give ourselves to worship as we uh, um, There might be someone who's got a specific word um, or picture or prophecy. If you could just come to the front, just um, tell Rod or me, then we'd love to uh, see if that's... Um, for them.